This episode of Real Ag Radio is brought to you by high-performing new Carbine Insecticide from FMC. Carbine Insecticide delivers fast, selective, and extended control of aphids in alfalfa and pulses, leaving beneficials like lady beetles to help in the fight. Ask your retailer today. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Lag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Tuesday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Lag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a part of your workday. Big shout out to everybody also listening out there on the Real Lag Radio podcast, no matter where you're farming, Canada, the U.S., or beyond. And uh, we're going to break down a lot of great stuff here today. Looking forward to having... Chip Flory, great friend of mine, host of AgriTalk, will be on the show here today. We're going to talk about the corn and soybean market as well as spring wheat, uh, the three main crops that Chip follows, and, and really kind of hone in on what direction and what is the sentiment of, of these three, and what are some of the indications to try to maybe help you out a little bit in some of your, your marketing plans that you have here on this 23 crop. Of course, uh, you know, and, and as we're going to hear as I was going to say, of connecting the dots here to uh, having Justin Funk from Real Agri Studies on the show here today. We're going to talk about our Canadian Farmer Sentiment Index and what the March results for the Canadian Farmer Sentiment Index are telling us. And uh, we're definitely a lack of confidence when it comes to the direction of the market and a slight reduction in people's lack of confidence in their own marketing plan as of March. And I don't blame you. (laughs) So hopefully Chip can help us out here today when we talk to him. We're also going to hear a product spotlight today with John Gavzlowski. And we're going to talk about the new season being launched, the Pest and Predator podcast. Season four. Hard to believe. Season four, Pest and Predator. We're learning all about beneficial index, or sorry, beneficial insects. And Dr. Glavzlowski will be here to talk about uh, this upcoming season. We'll also have time today for the top ag news stories of the day. If you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media platforms, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, as well as TikTok. Or you can always call the Real Ag Feedback Line. That number is 855-776-6147. Speaking of feedback, got an email here from Jerry. Jerry, I think, heard my interview last week with Greg Northey of Pulse Canada talking about some of the transportation items that were in the federal budget. Jerry says, hey, Sean, $52 million for a Transport Canada supply chain office. How about putting that money towards solutions to loading ships in the rain, building a better bridge to the North Shore, setting up a grain corridor on the way to the port so that that changes to the track don't require approval from 16 municipal authorities? We get a supply chain office? Virtual signaling, virtue signaling at its best, says Jerry. Yeah, you know, that was one of the notes that I made, I think, Jerry, on the show is that... How come we didn't deal with uh, the fact we can't load ships in the rain at the Port of Vancouver? You know, through the winter, this, so this is an issue that's existed for a while, is my understanding, but it's it's one that you would think we could fix relatively easy with a little bit of money, a little bit of know-how, some some innovation, but clearly not as it's, it's still an issue that is, is yet to be... And by the way, if you don't know Vancouver geography or Vancouver weather patterns very, very well, it rains a lot there. It's not exactly... It ain't Phoenix. That's for sure. There's, there's, that's not in dispute. So, uh, Jerry, I, I hear you on that one. Uh, kind of frustrating when it comes to some of the challenges that uh, need to be fixed going forward for Canadian grain exports. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to hear from Chip Flory, host of AgriTalk, right after this. 
Maximize your yield potential by improving your nutrient use efficiency with Wolf Tracks DDP micronutrients from Coke Agronomic Services. Wolf Tracks micronutrients allow crops to consistently access the nutrients they need when they need them. And with even coat technology, Wolf Tracks products thoroughly coat each and every granule, giving you an even distribution and placing micronutrients in close proximity to growing roots. Better nutrition, better crops, better farming. Get started today at wolftracksmicros.ca. That's Wolf T R A X Micros. How's your seed quality? What should you treat with? What about herbicide carryover and environmental concerns? Spring is here, and you've got a lot of things to think about in regards to your pulse crop. The Pulse School on Real Agriculture has information and advice for all these questions and more to help you navigate this season. Brought to you by BASF. Pulse School episodes are available at pulseschool.com, realagriculture.com, or as a podcast on your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. Looking for robust, reliable grain storage solutions? AGI leads the industry in quality, innovation, and offerings to protect your investment. Designed for exceptional cleanout, superior strength, and unbeatable versatility, you can rest easy knowing your grain is secure in an AGI West Steel bin. With 100 years of manufacturing experience, AGI West Steel bins will exceed your expectations for reliable storage. AGI West Steel, long-term safe storage. Find AGI at your local dealer. This segment of Real Ag Radio is sponsored by Coke Agronomic Services, creators of Anvil Nitrogen Stabilizer. Defend against volatilization, boost efficiency, accomplish more. Learn more about Anvil and the other nutrient management, nutrient protection, and seed enhancement solutions at CokeAgronomicServices.ca. Well, let's let's talk to Marcus. Try to get a read on what exactly is happening in these global commodity complexes: corn, soybeans, spring wheat. And more. Joining me right now is my good friend, the host of Agri Talk. It is Chip Flory. Chip, great to see you. I'm doing well, Sean. It's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Okay, so Chip, what's your read right now on the on these markets? Farmers feel like I don't know if it's quicksand, but it's at least feels like a little bit of cracked ice here on the outlook. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, just the uh, hesitancy of the markets to kind of break away and move to the upside on some when we've gotten some good news and I'm looking at the corn market in particular, we've had a nice run of export demand. We had an announcement back on the sixth uh, of another sale and we're really not getting much of a reaction out of the market at that time. Now, the other thing that is going on is we, we got the prospective plantings report that was a bit negative for corn, but the grain stocks report was a positive for corn. So that kind of balanced out. Now the question becomes, can we get all of the 92 million acres planted? And, and you know, in some areas, we're at the insurance go date where you can go ahead and get your your crop planted. And if it fails, you can the crop insurance will help to cover the, the replant. But at the same time, I got a note from a buddy up in South Dakota. He's right on the North Dakota line. He sent me a, a picture of him and his son and a bunch of walleye that they caught through the ice. They're still ice fishing in South Dakota. They should be getting they should be getting the spring wheat crop planted. They should be getting prep work done to get corn planted. And they're still ice fishing. I it just it, it blows me away. So there's some anxiety over that 92 million acre number in corn too, that that's gonna prevent the selling. In, in old and new crop, uh, but it's not a big enough issue or concern at this point to push that D's contract back up to that 590 range. What does history tell us when the market doesn't accept good news like we think it should? Um, well, number one, that's not that's not bullish when the market refuses to go up on on friendly news uh it's i don't want to take it as as a sell signal Mm -hmm. but it may be telling us that uh the the market is trying to hit the reset button and figure out where it's going to go from here and even even though we are anticipating some planning delays up in the northwest production areas 
we we've got to take a look at what's going on in the eastern corn belt in Iowa in Illinois in Nebraska there's going to be some some progress this week i think uh there's there's going to be enough progress on enough acres early enough in the season that it's going to feel like this crop is getting planted on a timely basis and you know what the first the, the the first 85 million acres might get planted on a on a timely basis yeah. but we've got a lot of acres that are going to be late this year and and we need to make an adjustment for that at some point yeah you, you talk about the anxiety around the 92 uh, predicted planting of corn mm-hmm. what number of actual planted corn is sort of that line where we're like Ugh, like we're yeah. this sort of the the scent things change, right? Yeah. Because we have a production number that we expect based on yep. trend yield. Like, what, what is that number for planted acres? Well, uh, you know, I'll call uh, the trend line yield on corn is 181.5. So just call it 180. Uh, every million acres that doesn't get planted potentially represents 180 million bushels of corn. So as we're looking at, at carryover and, and, uh, stocks to use estimates for the 2023-24 marketing year. If we take away 180 million, 360 million, 540 million, it adds up very quickly if we don't get all 92 million acres planted. And I think, you know, just the way things are setting up right now, if we can get to 90 million planted on corn, I think that's kind of the, the, uh, the the ex well i don't know if that's the expectation of the market but there's two million acres easily that are at risk of of losing oh yeah so you take 360 million bushels out of the supply and we're not going to be moving carryover to the upside much at all in 23 24 marketing year so i would say that that's kind of the number 90 million we need to get at least that much planted yeah, and as there is, there, you know, if as corn acres are switched out, they obviously go into soybeans. Um, demand, you know, is that market able to 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 take in that extra volume? Is demand strong from a, a domestic crush standpoint, and obviously the export market? Uh, y- yes, but I'm not convinced that it's going to go to beans. Okay, it, it may go straight to prevent plant uh, because the numbers work. Uh, might even generate a bit more revenue than what you might expect off of soybeans planting them late. So there, there may be a, you know, don't consider soybeans go straight to prevent plant move on some of those acres this year. And, and uh, it, you know, you like to, I like to think that growers, if they get a chance to grow a crop, they're going to produce a crop, uh, even if it's their second choice or, or even a third choice. But I don't know if we can make that that uh, assumption. Now, if it does go to soybeans, uh, every million acres up from that 87.5 represents about 50 million bushels of beans. Right now, we're, you know, we get the uh, the supply and demand report this morning and, a, and an adjusted uh, carryover estimate for the 2022-23 marketing year. It's expected to be about 200 million bushels. But if we're at 200 million bushels on carry in, it, we're looking at a situation for the 23 24 marketing year where maybe a 220, a 230, something like that. But it's not the 280 or 300 million bushels that, that USDA had us thinking about back in, in February from the Outlook Conference. It, it's going to be 250 or less when we get an update next month on the new crop marketing. Uh, there's not a lot of wiggle room on that either. And if if you do get enough bean acres, push 2 million over something like that to beans, uh, boy, you know, you start talking about getting that carryover up into that 300 million bushel range again. If we, if we print a 300 million bushel carryover expectation for 23, 24, that's a market that'll go looking for some extra demand and and uh, try to get some of the the export uh, share back and and you know we've got 
we've got the crush facilities coming on. There's another crush plant that is actually ahead of schedule up in Northwest Iowa, the platinum plant. Uh, just saw a press release on it this morning. They're going to be taking beans by spring of 24. That wasn't expected to happen until the fall of 24. So that's going to be uh, some additional old crop demand that will come in. They're going to, they're going to crush, what was it? 110,000 bushels of beans a day. Uh, It's a big number, big number, 35 million bushels in the year. So yeah. Who builds anything ahead of schedule nowadays? This is uh, yeah. I know. There's the, the there's the anomaly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Who, who is how they get the parts? Of, who's in charge of construction procurement? <laughs> there, that, that person should be president. Okay, um, uh, wheat. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, of uh, this is an interesting one too because you know I I was looking at the September chart the, this morning and. Boy, you know, it, it, it's really kind of floated recently between that eight and nine and touched uh, touched nine, but didn't quite get to eight. It tried um, back in about, I think, eight and three quarters. So what do we make of this uh, spring wheat market? Uh, the spring wheat market is as much up in the air as anything else. You talk about a market that's got to get all intended acres planted. You, <laughs> you better be looking at spring wheat. Uh, the reason that I say that is because of the terrible condition of the HRW crop. Good grief. 28% graded good to excellent, 36% rated poor to very poor. That's the general numbers. But when you look at some of the conditions up in, in, in Kansas and, and the HRW acres in general, th- these crop ratings are historically low, historically bad. And, uh, uh, we've got to find we've got to find a way to to replace some of that production that's going to be lost in HRW and spring wheat's the best way to replace it. We need to get all ten and a half million acres planted so that spring market's got to got to be engaged. And uh, you know, all all the markets really have to be engaged in in providing incentive to to produce and get all intended acres planted. I I just don't think there's any question about it and. Wheat, if we had any kind of demand to go along with it in the export market, I think the market would just be on fire. You'd see that spring market in that 930, 940 range trying to give incentive to get the crop in. Yeah, well, that's the positive, though. There's there's something to look forward to there, definitely on that spring wheat market. There's going to be music to the ears of a lot of our viewers and listeners in in Western Canada and in the Northern Plains, for sure. Um, Finish up with the Ukraine-Russia grain deal. Uh, What do we make of this? Because everybody I talk to seems to have some sort of different opinion on the significance. We're here in Russia may, you know, decide to even pull out of the one that they just negotiated. That was a 60 day deal. Is this the end chip of of these grain deals, or is this just Russia talking a bunch of smack and just trying to get what they want, get these sanctions removed? Yeah, it, my gut tells me that we're not going to see Russia participate in another grain deal. It's what my gut tells me, but we don't know. Uh, nobody knows what Putin is going to do. That's that's one of the reasons that the wheat market is kind of as. The anxiety level is as high as it is. It, well, and corn, corn is as well, because it. I, I just find it more than coincidental that that Chinese President Xi visits Moscow, and uh, after he leaves Moscow, we start hearing a different line, a different rhetoric coming out of out of Putin and and Russia about this grain deal, and it just seems to me. That without officially announcing that Russia and China have uh, have have come to some sort of a, a trade agreement on grain, we haven't seen any official announcement. But it, it seems like they've come to some kind of an agreement mm. on on grain coming out of out of Russia, and Russia will get it one way or another. If it had, un- unless Ukraine is successful in in pushing troops out. Russia will get the grain that it needs to ship to to China one way or another. They'll either grow it or they'll take it. Uh, so that's that seems to be the direction that that they're going on that. Um, so you know the U.S., Canada. I would throw Australia into it, but we've got 
you know, it looks like a pretty quick transition from La Nina to Enzo Neutral to El Nino. Uh, and the the potential of El Nino scares the heck out of the Australian producers, as it should. I mean, yeah. it, it's it could turn into a pretty tough growing season for them uh, in, in short order. So can't really rely on Australia a lot to to move grain into in, into China. But I, boy, I, you know, if I had the absolute right answer to what Russia is going to do with grain flow out of the Black Sea, um, we, we'd be ahead of the game. That's for yeah. sure. But, also call your options broker. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and we're starting to see countries like Poland, I think was one Bloomberg's yeah. been kind of on this story where they're, you know, starting to farmers are starting to get mad about some of the yeah. imports of some of the Ukrainian grain that, that that's got to be concerning for Ukraine from a sentiment standpoint is they, is they need support from Europe, yeah. their European allies, not never yeah. mind uh, the U S yeah. And Kazakhstan has banned the import of Russian grain now. Uh, that that was was done because they don't want to be the middleman of Russian grain sales. So because there was a lot of grain that was flowing from Russia into Kazakhstan and then Kazakhstan into the rest of the world and then the money back into the Russian war machine. So they've they've banned the import of. Yeah, I keep going back to a panel that that I moderated at Top Producer Summit. Uh, Steve Freed was on it. Matt Roberts was on it. And uh, Ambassador Kip Tom was on it. And we were just talking about global grain flows and how things would be changing in the year ahead. Those are three of the smartest guys that, that I know when it comes to talking about what the, the, the grain trade flows will look like in 2024, 2025. They didn't have an idea. They, they, they just they had an idea, but they weren't, con, you know, committed to their idea yeah. on it. So I think it's just kind of a, a go with the punches attitude on grain trade right now for for wheat in particular, but corn you got to include in that as well. Hey Chip, this has been fantastic. Really appreciate yeah. it. Uh, looking forward to uh, chatting with you again on Friday on Agri Talk as we always yeah. do. Uh, keep up the great work, bud. Absolutely. Thanks, Sean. When we come back on Real Ag Radio, we're going to hear about the new season of the Pest and Predator podcast with Dr. John Gavzlowski right after this quick break. How's your farm's financial performance? Know where you stand and take your operation to the next level with FCC Benchmarker. Compare your farm performance against similar-sized operations in your area with FCC Benchmarker, a new tool from Farm Credit Canada. It helps identify your strengths and areas for improvement and empowers you to make strategic business decisions. Ready to start? Contact your local Farm Credit Canada office for details. As you head out into the field this season, the Corn School's got you covered. Everything from tillage discussions, weed control info, field trial results, yield strategies, and more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. If you're thinking about growing oats in 2023, how about trying CDC Endure from Alliance Seed? CDC Endure Oats is consistently one of the top yielding varieties in the Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta provincial yield trials. With strong standability, excellent disease resistance, and excellent end use quality, CDC Endure might be the variety for you and your farm. Available from authorized Alliance Seed retailers, Parrish and Heimbecker, Patterson Grain, and Northwest Terminal. For more information, visit allianceseed.com. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio. It's now time for a product spotlight, uh, all about the Pest and Predator podcast. And the Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grain Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Joining me right now is Dr. John Givlowski. He's an entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture. John, great to chat with you. 
Good chatting with you, Sean. Okay, we got another season of the Pest and Predator podcast. I, I'm, I've been really, really uh, enjoying myself recording them with all of the researchers and extension specialists. It is really great. John, what, what is the Pest and Predator podcast from your perspective, and what can listeners expect in what I can't believe is going to be season four? Yeah, yeah, coming up already. Yeah, it's a series of interviews with entomologists from across the prairies, and we're talking about pests and predators that are common in Western Canada. And what we'll be doing is we'll be bringing you the latest information on pests that you may encounter in your fields and the beneficials that help to control them. And with each episode, we feature a different entomologist on a different topic. And uh, new for this year, there's going to be one of my colleagues talking about ground beetles uh, that eat both pests and weed seeds. So often we uh, focus more on the, the, their predaceous skills, eating other insects, but some of them are actually good weed seed consumers too. So that might be one for people to uh, tune into. Um, listeners will also learn about uh, the role that beneficial insects can play in their fields and ways that we can protect them and some scouting tips. Okay, so w- why do this series? As an entomologist, you know, as you look at this and you know, communicating with the audience, why, why do this series? Well, what we want to do is to increase awareness of the presence and the value of beneficial insects in Western Canadian fields with uh, growers and their crop advisors. Uh, we also want to relate professional research and observations to what a grower could encounter in their fields. Now, now I mentioned Western Grains Research Foundation as uh, the sponsor here. Uh, talk a little bit about that relationship. Yeah, so uh, Western Green Grains Research Foundation, um, they're the sponsor of this podcast series. Uh, they've been sponsoring the podcast series since 2017. And as an entomologist, I'm grateful that the uh, Western Grains Research uh, Foundation uh, supports projects like the Field Heroes, which help raise awareness of beneficial insects and help to get our research out into the hands of crop advisors and farmers. How often are we going to be putting out the episodes? So um, they're going to be up bi-weekly and uh, starting on April the 18th. And the last episode is on June 27th. So it'll be running uh, April, May, and June. Uh, And we've timed the podcast strategically to help with insect scouting efforts uh, throughout the growing season. As you look at the 2023 growing season, what are your expectations when it comes to pest pressure? Well, the two that I would say to uh, make sure you have on your scouting list are flea beetles and grasshoppers. Uh, They're two that we can probably uh, more confidently predict we'll likely see some heavy populations of. Flea beetles, we've been at chronically high levels for a few years, so we're trying to encourage growers, whatever you can do, to get your canola off to a uh, quick germination and quick early growth will help reduce your risk for the flea beetles. Grasshoppers, um, they do well when we have successive hot, dry years. Their populations have built up, and they had good egg-laying conditions across the prairies last year. So keep grasshoppers on your scouting list as well. Yeah. And, John, so much of the Pest and Predator podcast is about you know that, that the, the beneficials and learning about you know those field heroes working for you for free to help you with pest control. Why is this knowledge so important? Yeah, a couple of reasons. Um, one, being able to identify uh, what is a beneficial. Is this an insect that's helping you or, or eating your crop? And we did have instances last year where some of our beneficials, which maybe aren't as easy to identify, uh, agronomists and growers were calling in asking, uh, and I'll use the example of hoverfly larvae, um, are these something I need to be worried about or are they actually doing some good? So being able to differentiate good bug crop feeder is good to do. Also, uh, can we um, use that to help us make crop management decisions? If you know what the good bugs are and you know what they're eating and how much they're feeding on, you can use that information to help with your, your, your management decisions. Great stuff. We've been talking to Dr. John Gavlowski. He's an entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture and a frequent guest on the Pest and Predator podcast. John, thanks so much for joining us here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sean. 
And of course, you can get the Pest and Predator podcast. You know what? We're on season four, but you can go back and listen to season one, two, and three just to get yourself primed and ready to go for the first episode here coming out on April 18th in season four. You can get that wherever you get your podcasts or, of course, find it at realagriculture.com. We'll be right back on Real Ag Radio right after this. MNP's farm management consulting team is proud to help farmers and livestock producers remain competitive and profitable. Our team is made up of professional agrologists and consultants who come from extensive agriculture backgrounds themselves and offer a high level of technical expertise, first-hand knowledge, and close relationships within the agriculture industry. Whether you're looking for help with your day-to-day challenges or require specific advice, our customizable service offering means you can call on us for whatever advice you need. Visit us at mnp.ca to learn more. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on this Tuesday edition of the show. This segment is brought to you by Granny Boar from U.S. Borax. Go to borax.com and ask for it by name. That is U.S. Borax. Now joining us is Justin Funk of Real Agri Studies. Justin, great to have you back on the show. Hey, thanks a lot, Sean. Okay, so we have the results of our Canadian Farmer Sentiment Index, uh, the results for March. And this is something we've been doing since September, every other month, and uh, some really, really fascinating results that we've seen. Now, w- w- I think where we should start is just re-explaining kind of how we get to some of these index numbers. Yeah, you bet. So uh, the goal is to measure farmers' sentiments or or attitudes and feelings towards a number of different issues, like how they feel about their farms' current and future financial performance, their optimism and outlook towards the ag industry, confidence in making investments, outlook on grain markets, etc. And so in the survey, what we do is we ask a question, we ask the farmer to respond with either a, a positive response, like I feel good about this, or I don't feel good about this. So positive and negative. We subtract one from the other to leave us with a differential. We add that to 100, and that creates the index. So anything above 100, we would consider to be a positive sentiment. Anything below 100 would be a negative sentiment. And so the goal is that we ask the same questions the same way every time so we can measure how the needle is moving from period to period and around other industry events that are happening. Yeah, great stuff. Okay, let's dive into it. Uh, At the beginning, we always ask about current farm financial performance and future farm financial performance. And these don't always work in the same sort of manner. Uh, what, What do we find in March? Well, in March, we we continue to see current farm financial performance in positive territory. In fact, if you go back to September, we were at a 108, and now we're at 115. But in January, we had seen it get all the way up to 119. So it's starting to level off a little bit, but still remaining in positive territory. Uh, You look at future farm financial performance. uh, It started relatively low in September at 74. So that's in negative territory, still in negative territory, but it's risen up to about an 87. And I I think there's a number of factors that can account for that. Uh, One, of course, would maybe be easing up on some of the input costs since, since the first time that we uh, ask the question. Yeah, because we've definitely seen the the market pull back during this time period. You know, you, you're correct. Uh, what has pulled back for sure is those input costs, which uh, obviously farmers were paying pretty close attention to uh, for sure. Now, uh, we also ask about optimism toward the Canadian ag economy and uh, their outlook on the future of the ag economy. What did uh, farmers tell us there? Well, this one's been b- bouncing around a little bit since we first started the project. Uh, it's in negative territory, uh, in and around the 
80 to 85 mark. So it's not super negative, but uh, we are seeing that there is some, I'll call it pessimism towards the future of the ag economy and the ag industry, both short and long term. And, you know, I think one of the things you and I are really interested in observing as we continue to do this is, are we always going to see this in negative territory? Will this ever venture into positive territory or is negative in and around the 80 to 85 mark, you know, so below 100, sort of the norm that we should be expecting anytime people are projecting out into the future? Yeah, I, I've, I've kind of wondered this. You know, if you, if you think back to the current farm financial performance and the future farm financial performance, uh, we, we have seen the current is always higher than the future. What would the parameters, the the situation have to be for that to change? Uh, so far, we haven't found it. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but clearly at, right now, farmers are feeling a little bit better about the now than what's in in front of them. We, we also asked farmers about uh, the their confidence in making farm investments. So this is like buildings and equipment, you know, investing capital, right? And... Uh, What's interesting here, well, I'll let you explain the, the findings, but I, I find this uh, one of the, the fascinating pieces of uh, this month's survey. So this is the lowest sentiment index number that we have. Uh, it started in September at a 59. So you know that's well below that 100 mark. Uh, almost immediately after we conducted the first survey, uh, the Bank of Canada announced an interest rate increase. And in the next iteration of the survey, we saw that number drop down to 54. Now, what's interesting is that it stayed at 54 for both November and January. We do this every two months. And then when we did it again in March, just a few weeks ago, uh, it went down just a tad to 52. So it's kind of remaining steady at that 52. There's, There's some farmers who are you know, willing to make those investments now, but the majority of them kind of look at this as not being a good time to do so. Yeah. And what I, you know, sort of spin around in my brain is, you know, there's clearly things that have changed in the external environment to warrant changes to, you know, how people feel about their financial future. We're going to get to some of the outlook on the selling of crops here in, in a second, but this number has not really moved. So what are the factors, the, 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 the situation in order to provide people with more confidence in order to make those capital investments? And, and I also sort of, you, you look at what's happened with the price of land, it, you know, it did not necessarily back off in, in 2022, up over 12% across the country. Um, maybe, you know, farmers may have a low confidence in making farm investments, but the machinery market and the land market are still quite strong. And so, there's is 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 there a separation here between confidence and willingness? Do you think, or is what do you what are your well, thoughts? Just out of interest, I decided uh, before our interview today to do another layer of analysis to look at how did somebody who answered the question around current and future farm financial performance answer the question about confidence in making farm investments? And as you would probably imagine, there's a direct relationship there that if I'm more optimistic towards my farm's future financial performance, I'm also more willing to make investments in the farm. So uh, what, what is contributing to that, uh, not necessarily sure, you know, future farm financial performance, there could be a lot of variables there, but those that feel that way about their farm's financials uh, also feel more confident in making investments in the farm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, confidence in marketing crops and also outlook on selling crops. These are two different kinds of questions, and we are seeing different results. So, uh, explain. Yeah, so uh, first of all, the difference in the questions one is relating more to the person and their abilities, you know, their confidence in am I making the right decision? Do do I know what I'm doing? Um, So, it's more based on skills and, and, uh, and competencies. But then there's the, what's actually happening in the market, what I think is going to happen. And that's the outlook question. So w- with respect to confidence, it, it, it's it, we, we saw this one start off in higher territory, just above the 100 mark in September, and it slowly crept down to just below the 100 mark now at about 89. It's been a steady decrease. And I think you could probably... Uh, draw the connection there to what's been happening on the commodity market side, where we look at the outlook on selling crops, which the question is phrased as, should should I be selling now because prices are headed lower, uh, or should I be holding because prices are headed higher? 
Well, here's where we've seen the most dramatic change from period to period. We started off in September. Now, now take yourself back to September and commodity markets. We were at 128, and it was by far the most positive sentiment that we had. Uh, in November, it dropped just below 100 to 98, and now we're at 74. And so you really see the steep drop off there and what farmers think are going to happen with those commodity markets. And you can probably trace that back to how they answer some of the other questions as well. Yeah. And what I find, you know, even though we have seen a slipping in the confidence in marketing crops, I think it's still a positive result in the sense that even with the commodity market falling as much as it has, and, and you just outlined the outlook on selling crops and how far that has fallen, the the confidence in marketing crops has not dropped that dramatically in, in comparison to. So, um, and I... I feel for, for sympathetic for the audience because, yeah, this is a really, really difficult time. It's easy to have a lot of confidence in marketing your crops when the market's going straight up for 18 months, right? You hold and you sell as you just need some cash. Well, you still may need some cash, but now when is the best time or the ideal time? And you may be forced into a sale to generate some cash, but you know when, when it's up to you, this is a much more difficult market to to do so. So, uh, yeah, that that was one of the things that that I pulled out of that. Okay, so finally, we ask about the state of mental health. What did farmers say there? So, encouragingly, uh, this number has remained relatively steady uh, at I'll call it the neutral line. So f- farmers are not necessarily in a better position mental health wise than they were a year ago and not necessarily in a worse position than they were a year ago. First time we asked this question, <clears throat> it was at 92. So it was just below. And this was in September, right? sort of pre-harvest activities or just getting into harvest. You know, things are really busy, uh, a lot of unknowns with respect to, you know, how, what's the financial position going to be like this year? As we got into November, the number went up by six points to 98. So just below the 100. You know, you, you look at that time of year, harvest activities were concluding. Now we get to the winter months, both in January and in March, uh, and the number is steady uh, for both periods at 100. And so it, I'm really curious to see what's going to happen to this number as we get back into the busy time of year w- with seeding and planting, you know, as we get into our next survey, which will be May, uh, to see if this number goes up further. Yeah, hey, we're out in the field. Things are good. I feel better. Uh, or if it goes down, so I'm, I'm overwhelmed, overloaded, uh, got a lot to do. It, it, I think we'll learn a lot in the next iteration of the survey. Yeah, absolutely. If you're interested in finding out more about the Canadian Farmer Sentiment Index or any of the other work that Real Agri Studies is doing with its insights panel, I encourage you to go to Real Agri Studies. Dot com. We're always looking for more farmers to join the panel, and the best part is it is free, and uh, you get a great video sent back to you analyzing the high-level results. So go to realagristudies.com. Hey, Justin, thanks so much for joining us here today. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Sean. Take care. We'll be right back on Real Ag Radio with the top ag news stories of the day. What can we do for you? Yeah, I'm looking for some nitrogen. All right, we're running low and it's awful pricey, but uh, let me check. Hold. The answer to low supply and high prices for nitrogen is Invita, a microbe with systemic nitrogen fixation. Invita works throughout the foliage and roots, providing a right place, right time source of nitrogen to maximize yield in corn, wheat, and soybeans. Yeah, we're all out, but... You know what? I'll take some of that Invita. <laughs> That's what I was going to recommend. Book your Invita while supplies last. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio. Grow more, risk less, realize greater yield potential, and address zinc deficiency while improving soil health. Soilios Zinc delivers ROI you can count on and is backed with a product guarantee. Try it today. Learn more about Soilios 
That's S-O-I-L-E-O-S dot com. Let's get to the top ag news stories of the day. We're going to have the Bank of Canada come out uh, tomorrow with their decision on interest rates. Interesting story in the Globe talking about how the Bank of Canada is really between a rock and a hard place. So ahead of the Bank of Canada's next interest rate decision, one chief market strategist said it, he expects the central bank to hold rates while acknowledging current risks in the economy. Canada Central Bank is set to announce its next policy rate decision on Wednesday. Carl Schmayata, a chief market strategist at CorePay, said in an interview with BNN Bloomberg Monday that he thinks the Bank of Canada will acknowledge downside economic risk stemming from volatility in the U.S. banking sector. This is something that we chatted about here on the show yesterday. He also expects the central bank to also recognize signs of resilience in the economy, which he said has grown more rapidly than projections from the Bank of Canada. He said gains in employment have spurred increases in aggregate spending. He does expect a future decline in consumer spending, which is likely to weigh on the Canadian economy and bring about negative growth. He said that following outsized increases to interest rates, Canadian consumers will likely curtail spending as they deal with higher debt loads. Canada Central Bank has increased interest rates eight times in 2022, while before electing to hold its policy rate at 4.5% in March. A lot of coverage of the IMF expecting global growth at 2.8% this year and 3% in 2024, slightly below the fund's estimates published in January. The IMF said its baseline forecast assumes that the recent financial sector stresses are contained. The IMF stressed that signs of resilience alongside lower global global energy and food prices masked a darker reality. Uh, The IMF's chief economist said, Below the surface, turbulence is building and the situation is quite fragile. Inflation is much stickier than anticipated even a few months ago. More worrisome is that the sharp monetary policy tightening of the past 12 months is starting to have serious side effects for the financial sector. Did mention, though, also the upshot is risks to the outlook are heavily skewed to the downside with the chances of a hard landing having risen sharply, said the IMF. So uh, that, mm, that'll get your attention. If you're, <laughs> it, it also doesn't it kind of connect to the fact that Bank of Canada will not raise here? Like, we've got to be careful. There's a real lagging impact of some of these higher rates. And with uh, so many consumers so close to the knife financially, from a savings perspective, we got to be cautious here. We don't go too far too soon. Today, the governor of Saskatchewan welcomed the announcement that Louis Dreyfus Company will expand its canola crushing facility at Yorkton. A uh, quote here from the Trade and Export Development Minister, Jeremy Harrison, who said, This major investment by LDC is good news for Saskatchewan canola growers and good news for workers and the economy in Yorkton and right across the province. The facility's new capacity will be over 2 million metric tons, which is more than double its current capacity. LDC initially opened the facility in Yorkton in 2009 and currently employs approximately 120 people. In addition to helping with the canola crushing goal, the expansion puts the province closer to meeting several other key goals outlined in Saskatchewan's growth plan. The signing of a memorandum of understanding between the governments of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba will foster the development of a new economic corridor across the three provinces. The groundbreaking partnership aims to bolster economic growth and collaboration while strengthening the region's position as a key player in the global market. Over the last decade, regulatory uncertainty, anti-development policies, and a lack of national leadership have cost provinces an opportunity to pursue projects that would have created thousands of jobs and billions of dollars in growth and investment. The three provincial governments will work together to eliminate regulatory inefficiency and uncertainty to attract and develop nation-building projects. Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba will coordinate to identify and prioritize strategic infrastructure that will enhance trade and transportation between the provinces and around the world. Okay, so the Prairie Province is working a little bit closer together and getting some shots in at the Fed at the same time in the press release. Uh, we heard this from Chip Flory when we had him here earlier on the show, but uh, already the worst in a quarter century, the condition of the 2022-23 U.S. winter wheat crop took another step back this past week. 
Monday's USDA crop progress report pegged the nationwide winter wheat crop at 27% good to excellent as of Sunday, down a single point from a week earlier when the USDA's initial spring wheat rating for the crop came in below trade expectations, the lowest in 27 years. And an estimated 37% of the crop was in poor to very poor condition as of Sunday versus 36% a week earlier. A significant portion of the week-over-week decline in the national winter wheat rating was due to Kansas and Oklahoma, where crops continue to struggle and uh, amid ongoing drought. On the other hand, soft red crops in the Great Lakes region showed improvement. Also in the U.S., U.S. corn planting slightly ahead of the average pace. An estimated 3% of the national crop was in the ground as of Sunday, up a single point in the week and ahead of 2% ahead of for both last year and five-year average. No planting had yet started in the number number one corn state of Iowa, but 1% of the Illinois crop was reported planted as of Sunday, which is on par with average. So, uh, yeah, farm again started. And and, and like Chip talked about, the the first 85 gets planted. (laughs) No, no question, right? It, it's the, the when we get into the fringe acre and, and where some of the weather, like North Dakota is a good example of what happens there. That's a lot of acres, okay? That, that's just one example of uh, where some of the concerns are um, on, on that planted acre. So a lot to follow there. And uh, of course, we will be uh, keeping in touch with that as the weeks progress. Australia has reached an agreement with China to resolve their dispute over barley imports. The two countries said on Tuesday a latest sign of improving ties between the major commodity trade partners. Relations between the two had been strained for years and worsened after Australia called for an inquiry into the origins of COVID, (laughs) triggering trade reprisals by Beijing, including anti-dumping duties on Australian wine and barley. Yeah, but, you know... China believes in rules-based trade, right? Yeah, so Australia questions where COVID came from, and China all of a sudden starts dropping any dumping duties on wine and barley. But tensions have eased since the center-left Labour Party won power last year in Australia. Foreign Minister Penny Wong met her Chinese counterpart Wang Yi in Beijing in December, the first such visit by an Australian minister since back in 2019. Chinese purchases of Australian coal resumed in January after almost three years, and imports of beer have, or sorry, imports of beef have accelerated. And this is one of the reasons why Canada is still left in the dark when it comes to beef exports to to China, for sure. This is the thing. This is the game. This is like China textbook. Like if you went to the university bookstore and said, "I want a book on Chinese trade." This is exactly what you would see is this kind of shenanigans. So Australia back in favor, countries like Canada pushed to the side. And this is why, you know, when, when, when you're doing a lot of business with a country like China, you, you know, Hey, you know, the, the water's warm and it's a, it's a get rich quick scheme because you know that tomorrow it could totally evaporate and have nothing to do, nothing to do with, with your product. So this is uh, th- this kind of narrative and this kind of these kind of examples continue to uh, just to, there's just so many right. Look at the Canadian canola situation right. We we fought that, uh, and Australia's dealt with a lot. <laughs> so they have they've been very much in the crosshairs of uh, of China, but it seems like uh, tensions have gotten uh, they've subsided at least for the moment. My, this is an unusual story. Miami-Dade police have arrested six, six suspects after they were busted for a dairy products theft ring and responsible for more than $1 million worth of stolen dairy items. According to the police report, the six suspects were all employees of a milk distributor, Island Dairy, that worked with MacArthur Dairy, a, a milk and dairy products company. Dubbed Operation Got Milk, the police report shared that since 2021, the suspects robbed more than $925,000 worth of milk, from MacArthur Dairy, along with $350,000 worth of milk crates, the Miami-Dade police shared that the suspects would swap the ordering system, causing extra dairy products to be loaded onto the distribution delivery trucks. According to the police, once they were out for delivery, the drivers would sway from their pre-assigned routes, meet with another individual, and transfer the extra dairy products to the delivery truck. Furthermore, the police shared that the Island Dairy contacted them after conducting an internal investigation that uncovered the irregularities and identified the potential suspects. Never mind like things like GPS tracking and things like that on trucks. How do you think you're going to get away with that in, in today's world? Uh. 
Nobody said there had to be smart criminals. Uh, anyway, uh, if you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. You can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can, of course, also find us across all the different social media platforms, or you can call that Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. Thank you so much for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio, and we'll, of course, chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for downloading this episode of Real Ag Radio brought to you by high-performing new carbine insecticide from FMC. New carbine insecticide hits aphids hard with effective, selective, and extended control. It also has activity on ligus and tarnished plant bugs. Ask your retailer today.